Ato sama sambudasa, nama tasa bagawato arahato sama sambudasa, nama tasa bagawato arahato sama sambudasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Pay homage to teaching and to his teaching. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, so I'm happy to see you. I hope we'll get some more here. I'm not sure. Did I? Did um, you say that whether they were coming or not? I don't know. Or they're usually here on Sunday, I think, aren't they? I can't remember. Uh, no, Paul, I think last time said that he, they, they were having a certain uh, meeting or some, uh, or an intensive course oh. or something like that. Okay, okay. Weekend. Okay, so... Um, well, what I want to go over today is we're going to do go through the foundation series. And in order to take you through this, I really want you to understand a little bit about it and where this came from, because it has to do more or less with the history of Damasuka and it has to do with uh, um, the research that Bhante Bhimala Ramsey did and I did with him as far as testing people and spending many years actually testing people in retreats and uh, deciding uh, on terminology and deciding on words that would be used. And they were not things that were decided by him because like it worked for him, it was, it was decided by um, by researching with people, the reactions that people had to understanding uh, the words and the concepts that that the Buddha was teaching. So another that's how we did these the word changes, and then the the other translation changes were not translation changes as much as they were choosing uh, synonyms for the words that were being used where we're teaching you the same exact thing, uh, but we are um, choosing words that make sense to you, words that you're gonna remember very easily. And so um, we had some requests for people to, to help to, to, before we do this this time to, because this will take some time. <laughs> You know, there is basically, let's let's get into it and you'll see what I mean. If we go down to share a screen and I bring this up, I'm going to show this to you two ways. Um, I'm going to show it to you. First of all, the ongoing course of where, um, let's see, this is the this is the ongoing course of what we were trying to put together. Now, remember, this was done back in 2010. And, this was compiled in the following year in 2011. And back then we didn't have the ability to print, to publish and all that stuff wasn't here. A lot of that came in with David Johnson. And that's one of the things that David did. It was like throw the whole system into another gear and really get it moving. Um, I still remember the statistics of, you know, how many people were coming in a summer and how many retreats were being scheduled and how many people were, uh, you know, the, what was exactly going on in the center and everything was still in slow motion, you know, from the beginning, from 2000, uh, we were in one location in 2003, we, we set up in Missouri and then we shifted a location to an official location where it is now, where DSMC is located. So that happened in about, um, we would say about 2005, uh, I would say probably 2005, when we shifted the organization of United International Buddha Dhamma Society, we shifted it from a 501c3 that was set up originally in Virginia and then took it away from Virginia and put it into Missouri because it made more sense. So that's the structure of this. And UIBDS, we don't hear about it very often. We never set up a website for it. 
I suppose we could, but we never, we never actually did that because United International Buddha Dhamma Society was, this, was an umbrella and DSMC was one of four or five projects that was underneath that. And those projects one at a time sort of disappeared because the primary project was Dhammasukha Meditation Center. And, and in building this, we realized that Bhante had put together, he had uncovered something uh, that was quite different from the way things were being taught in meditation. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to help people to understand that this was something that was for daily life living. And it was something that was for everybody to get involved in. It wasn't just for wealthy people who were going to pay thousands of dollars for retreats or symposiums or university study type level people. We wanted this to be for everybody. And so this was Bonte's dream was to have it become sort of a household word, uh, you know, to twim, I twim, you twim, we all twim. <laughs> you know, it was this little character in Popeye. I twim, do you twim? Well, I twim. And we used to make jokes about it, you know, everybody needs to twim and smile more often. So in setting this up, the idea first was just to, set up a framework of what is it that we're trying to pull together. And we're trying to pull together what is the, the basic information that people need to have in order to be successful in the meditation itself. What is going to help you and support you the fastest and it'll be the easiest for you to remember so that you will use it again and again and the repetition of it, um, the uh, reciprocity, the um, reciprocity, right? The repeating it, the repeating part was the most repetitious training was the way that this was working. Now, back then, nobody knew about, about uh, neuroplasticity. Nobody knew that in the end, the research for the brain was going to show that a person's behavior could be helped and could could change if they started repeating the the counterpart of that problem. In other words, if I was afraid, I would practice being courageous, and I would practice having courage. And if I was um, down all the time, I would get up and start by trying to do things that would help me stay up. These were basic. Uh, uh, concepts people had, but they hadn't looked very far into the fact that people really can change at any age. And when we were first starting to do this in 2000, um, when I first started working with him, um, at that time, these were things we talked to our children about, but we didn't use them as proponents uh, to help us to help people to change their um, behavior patterns so much. We weren't doing that. And um, so we started out by realizing, first of all, we're doing this in the United States. It's not a Buddhist country. And the one thing we had to do was start by explaining uh, the basics of what Buddhist, Buddhism is. Now, I just checked this this morning, Bonte, and I know there must be some place in there like this, but Right now, this is a 404, it's unavailable. This first link, I went to see if it was even there and it's not there anymore. I'm um, joking, I'm joking. So there must be something on the, on the place. Now, validation is still there. And you probably, you know that I've told you before to go to see the validation film to understand um, how you can help another person come out of being down and out, you know, and sad and everything and that we do affect people around us. We do have a, um, the power of uh, frequency. We have frequency that touches other people. We have um, the vibrations that are earth vibrations. And as human beings, every animal on the planet has vibrations that they put out and the other animals pick it up and we're no different. People are just like that. 
So in going through these dates, what they show you is if I if we were if we had worked on it a second time, it'll show uh, these dates. But I think the other the other list shows you um, some of these have been reworked and some of them have not been reworked. And once again, we'll try to spend our time now for a while, dedicate our time uh, to to upgrading these as we go along. So the first thing we talk about is what is Buddhism. What is it? And then the second thing we we show you the the next three of these um, are giving you an explanation and an exercise. Each one of these of what about Donna? How does that affect us? Generosity? Why is it important? What is the sila? What is it really for? Is it important for us to keep the sila or is it just something we give lip service to and we're all together? Like I used to think when I was young, um, we had a, um, an oath to the church that I belonged to. We gave lip service to it on Sunday and then we went out during the week and beat each other up, <laughs> you know, and we weren't exactly following the, the thing that we were saying in church and Sunday school every every week. And, and, and this is the problem with human beings is saying something, but then do as I say, don't, don't do it. I mean, do as I say, not as I do. And then you go out and you break this happens anyway. Sila is a protection for you and you all have learned that the protection of the Sheila um, to be able to understand this, to, to explain it to someone else, is use the umbrella. And what, what the umbrella is showing you, the Sheila is like an umbrella and it protects you from the attacking hindrances. They feel, it feels like they're attacking you. It feels like they're coming down on you like rain sometimes. It feels like, you know, there's two or three or four of them coming down together on you. And so this is why understanding um, that the uh, the Sheila protects you uh, from the hindrances that come later. Now, so the Dana and then the Sheila and the Bhavana, but understanding Bhavana is important because understanding that the uh, the Bhavana is both looking at how our mind changes, but also watching our our way of grading ourselves is how people begin to notice that your behavior changes too. And this is one of the things. So the bhavana is development of behavior, but development of the mind, the traditional way of saying development of the mind, but it res the result of that is development in behavior patterns. So that takes you through the, the first uh, part of this, the way this was originally planned. Now, what we're looking at here is what was originally planned. When we go to the other page, we're going to see what actually happened um, in, in those. Now, then here we go in section two, what is meditation? We try to take the meditation and explain to a person in a simple way, what is meditation and what is mindfulness? And then you have to have exercise for that person, a way of playing a game to discover for themselves, um, you know, how does this work with the work, the mindfulness and the meditation together. So the meditation is trying to see and see clearly and understand the four noble truths, the dependent origination, and the three characteristics and how they're all intertwined. And we shouldn't be uh, over time. What has happened is breaking off and saying the three characteristics are all you need to understand or dependent origination. We don't need that at all <laughs> or, or, or take, you see, and this is, this is what's happened. And we do need the dependent origination. And um, one of the things that uh, has been uh, written in one of the most recent books that has uh, come out, and the the problem I have with the uh, with the book, I, I think it's been put together really well. But the issue I have is it's for a certain level of reading, and a certain level of being able to take concepts and put them together and things, and and um, it it can be difficult to understand. But Delson Armstrong has put together this book, A Mind Without Craving. And right now, that's a pretty good way of looking 
at the dependent origination if you want to go really inside of it and tear it all apart. But but what we were after when we were looking at uh, at the meditation first, what is meditation? It's to understand what to understand the uh, the four noble truths. The dependent origination is human cognition is part of it, and the three characteristics of existence, which is the anicca, dukkha, anatta. Anicca, dukkha, anatta is the impermanence or everything is changing. Dukkha is when you start suffering because everything is changing and you don't like the change happening. And that's natural for the human being. And then the next one is anatta. And the anatta is basically the impersonal nature of absolutely everything the impersonal nature of it and considering it, not believing me, but taking it and, and using it yourself, examining it yourself to see if it's really true. If life is easier, if we don't take things so personally all the time, we have a choice and somehow human beings got to a place where they thought they didn't have a choice. They are simply, I feel this is moving in this direction. And so it has to be this way. No, it doesn't have to be this way. We have the opportunity uh, for, we have the opportunity for choosing how we're going to handle things. So I think across time uh, that we've lost a lot of our personal power outside of Buddhism. And I think one of the things that Buddhism did for me and for a lot of people that I've taught is when your life changes dramatically and you begin to see the difference in the way that you handle in this incidence and this incidence and this one and this situation differently, you begin to see that I'm asserting my personal power of decision based on the guidance of the dana and the shila and the bhavana that I've been practicing. That's what's happening during the development of the meditation. So what is the mindfulness part of this? The mindfulness part inside of this that we're going to hear about is mindfulness is an observation tool that you use to make the meditation actually work. So it's your patience and your ability to be still and look in the microscope and the microscope and don't move and just keep watching and keep watching what's happening in there the mind the the meditation is the microscope and you are the mindfulness is watching and observing and just observing just witnessing not trying to make anything happen but you are on an adventure to see what will happen if I just keep watching and I personally kind of move out of the way, what would happen if I did that? You see? And then the next part, why practice the meditation is kind of a giveaway because the, the plus in exercise and what happens, uh, why practice the meditation, go out and play with this. And this is the one where I'm trying to explain to people the best thing is to go down by the beach and start smiling at people. Smile at people when you're in a restaurant where you wouldn't normally just smile at a person. Smile at them when you go out and you're shopping. Make a point of eye contact with the cashier and smile at them when it's a Friday night and they're just exhausted and they don't want to be at work any more than you want to have to stop there and get something before you go home. But you you make eye contact with people. It's this connection, this break the barrier of human connection. It's a challenge to reconnect uh, humanity with each other to as you're going through with this. And then, so what is TWIM? How is it different? Now, we are probably going to rewrite these from what they were before somewhat. I have to go through them. That's what the exercise is for me to go through them and see 
where we are with how we talk about this. Each time we work on this, we work it a little bit better, I think. And when you're talking about what is TWIM, it's tranquility, meditation, tranquil, it's a, a tranquil, tranquility, it has to do with developing wisdom and wisdom comes from insight. And that's what the meditation is, TWIM. Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation. So it is an exercise in combining together um, in a cooperative way, serenity and insight practice, not in a way where it steps on each other. Let's not get emotional. <laughs> you know, it's not like two horses are on top of each other. It's two horses are beside each other like this, pulling a cart as a team. And when an insight pops up, this the insight horse goes, oh, that's a Nietzsche. Look at that. Wow. And then this serenity says, calm down a little bit. Come back. <laughs> Let's keep watching. And then that little horse goes again. He says, oh, look at that. Dependent origination. I just saw dependent origination. Okay, come on back down. Let's see how deep we can watch dependent origination. These two horses are these two, two uh, oxen pulling a cart. And you just imagine the one is dedicated to what will I find out next? What can I discover? And this is why we're an explorer. And that's what this fun about this. It's like a game of... of of, of um, you know, it's like, a, a, oh, what's that game where you go around and then you go up the ladder, Parcheesi, I think it was Parcheesi or something. And you have to go around the, around the board one time by rolling the dice. And then you get to go up to the top. We thought about trying to take the Parcheesi board and turning it into a twim uh, board game, you know, where you learn the different parts of all these pieces and how they work. And if you uh, roll the dice, you get to go three steps, but then if you, it says, pick a card, you pick a card up and it says, what is Donna? And if you answer correctly what Donna is, you get to go an extra space. We were playing uh, games with that one time, trying to design a board game, anything, so that we could learn the pieces and remember them and set them up so people would have fun with them and not make this, uh, you know, such a sort of a stick in the mud type thing, which this is not a stick in the mud thing. This is really an incredibly fun thing of full of discovery as you go along with this. So let's go down here. How is TWIM different from the other types of meditation is really simple over time. What's happened is the, um, and this happens maybe because of the human tendency or the human habitual uh, habit of, I have to belong to a group. I'm going to belong to serenity group. I'm going to belong to the insight group. I will deal with dependent origination. I won't look at it at all. I'm going to have an object. I'm not going to have any object, you know, and this is what has happened when we look at this over a broad uh, period of time. If we don't have a clear answer to give you, we seem to want to invent something new and start a new thing. This is different because instead of going forward that way in that direction only, Bhante Bhimala Ramsey turned around and went backwards. He went back into the text and just said, what if we all just stop a minute and take a look at the suttas that are talking specifically about the meditation and see if we took all of those out of this. And remember, he was only working with one book. He was only working with Majima Nikaya. And I still maintain my position on teaching is to have you really work only with the Majima Nikaya when you're learning this. Do it the same way he did. Then we can relate to you exactly how this happened. When we go to Samyutta Nikaya, we see smaller uh, suttas that support 
what it was the idea that was being taught in the, the Majjhima Nikaya. When we go to the Digha Nikaya, we see these really long suttas that would take a whole week just to teach one sutta. When we look at the Anguttara Nikaya, obviously what we're looking at, I mean, this is no secret, is let's see how much you can memorize of all the parts of Buddhism. What are the ones, the twos, the threes, the fours, the fives? It's a way, a system of not losing any of the pieces of the puzzle. It was a good idea. I bet you they had a lot of games that the monks played at that time. Like tonight, we're just going to talk about the fours. Who wants to start? The next night, we just talk about the threes and the twos and that sort of thing. There's nothing wrong with it. It was just designed as a specific method for preservation. That's just my opinion in this thing. Okay, and you look at the third part of this, you have to look at what a human being is when you start to apply, now that you've seen the framework, you have to say, where do we start with this? And where we start is we start with what is the human being, okay? And the human being is basically composed. If you go to any one of the retreats that you can find in the library that's set up at Dhammasukha Meditation Center, any one of the suttas, I'm sorry, retreats, the first retreat is going to contain a specific set of information, okay? And that information is composed of what is the human being. You have to start there. So what is the human being composed of? It wants you to understand the five aggregates and the six sense doors. And the issue of human cognition, how, what that's about what human cognition, how it operates, how the suffering is actually happening. And um, it's not just to understand these things, but to understand the innocence of these things. What do I mean? The aggregates are innocent. They do not cause you suffering. The aggregates themselves, body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness are simply the composition of a human being. And so that human being, if we know, look at it, that's what the basic human being is. That's what we have to work with. But your sense doors exist and you don't make them operate. They operate as systems in the body for your optical system for your eyes, your auditory system, for the ears, your olfactory system for the nose, ear, nose, and throat, and then the, the uh, oral system for the, uh, for the mouth, and then the physical body itself, the anatomy of the body, if we lay the person down and look at them, medically speaking, that's the being. We don't control this. This is what we actually are. And we're just trying to get ourselves to step back a minute, come down off of our high horse <laughs> and jump down for a minute and say, this is what a human being is. And this is first year medical school. This is what this is. First year medical school, this is the human being. And this is where we start with everything. Then from there, we look at how exactly does the suffering actually happen in this being. It happens from contact that flows through these six sense doors or six sense spaces when they operate. And we become consciously aware of them with as part of the aggregates, consciousness, consciously aware of what's happening in each one of the contacts through the six sense doors. And from there, we have three kinds of feeling that we experience. And the three kinds of feeling, it's all that the person needs. It is not the end of the story. It is not um, you know, the, the full complete lesson on Abhidhamma of all the 
possible feelings a person can feel. Abhidhamma came together, we should keep in mind, two or 300 years after the Buddha was gone. So why would we go to Abhidhamma to try to figure out what happened in the very beginning? It doesn't make sense to us. If we go to there afterwards, no problem. And if you really like to, to see there's 128 different types of feelings and more than that, 52 of this, 82 of this, 72 of this, and so forth. And if you want to learn it that way, that's good. You're mathematically gifted. <laughs> that's what I think in my mind. But if but I wouldn't want to think that I had to keep all those things in my mind in order to understand how the human being operates and what this all is about. And what we're really studying is how does the suffering happen? What is the suffering? What is the cause of the suffering? What is the cessation of the suffering? And can we have longer periods in our life of the cessation of suffering instead of suffering? Is that possible? That's a good deal. If we can figure out how to do that, that's a really good deal. Then we come into um, what is the problem or we're, when we start to look at what is the problem, we start to look at uh, what is the, um, uh, when we say the problem, what is the craving? That's where this all starts. This is where the Buddha leads us to say basically that um, the um, craving is where this starts. Now, as we go through this in our training, we find out there's more to it than just craving. Yes, we find out that. We find out ignorance of all the knowledge that I'm talking about can be a real problem. And just knowing about craving isn't quite enough. We have to know what it, what ignorance is and how the suffering completely operates. And so going into the red zone of the uh, dependent origination is where we take you to find out how this, what this, how this suffering actually is happening. And we start talking about, okay, craving. And then we do a lesson on clinging. Now, why are we going backwards? We're going, it seems like we're going backwards to us. But the reason that we're going backwards here has always been because this is how you can heal yourself. Actually, how we heal ourselves is by letting go of the um, the birth of the, um, and I wasn't going, actually, I wasn't going backwards, was I? <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, go back, let's erase that part, <laughs> cut that out. Um, what is craving? You look at craving first because we say craving is the cause of the suffering. So when we say what is craving, it is the I like it or I don't like it mind. That's what we're saying the craving is. That's what it feels like. Craving always manifests or always comes up first. I had at least 100 people ask me, what does manifest mean? Manifest means it comes up first. And the neatest part about what the Buddha figured out was he figured out how you can detect the arising of craving. That is the neatest thing. He didn't say craving is the problem and this is how it works. No, he went deeper to the very detection of the symptoms of the arising craving. And as he goes through the symptoms of arising craving, then we say, what is the cause of this craving? And the craving is caused by the clinging. And the clinging is all the thoughts and all of the all of the thoughts and ideas, imagination, concepts that you think of when you start to think about what it is you don't like. You have this running in your mind that starts going faster and faster. Clinging is the home of mental proliferation. 
and mental proliferation, if you go to Majima Nikaya number 18, the Honey Ball Sutta doesn't say clinging in the sutta, does it? Instead of saying clinging out loud, it says it's talking about the, um, my mind is skipping around on me, just a second here. Whenever he's talking in the Honeyball Sutta, he's not saying clinging per se. Where's the phrase? I thought I underlined. I never know which book I have here. You, can you find it? Do you remember what it was? You listen carefully to the... Yeah, it's the one, the one, how does he get to the war? He gets to the war. Mm. He gets to peace when he is, as to the source through which the perceptions are found, perceptions and notions are born of the mental proliferation, how they beset a man, how they confuse a man. I'm not finding the first, the first uh, paragraph. This happens every time I try to come through this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Sister Kema, is it section eight? That's the way to peace, I think. Wait a minute. As to the source through which perceptions and notions are born of mental proliferation beset a man, if nothing is found there to delight in. So if the person delights in it, that's where they have the, the, the suffering. But if they, there's nothing to delight in, in other words, their equanimity is developed strongly enough, they are not getting overexcited with it they don't welcome it and hold on to it, then this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, you see, and of the underlying tendency to aversion, liking it and wanting it or not liking it and wanting to push it away, you see, and of the underlying tendency to views and the underlying tendencies for doubts and the underlying tendencies uh, to ignorance. This is the end to resorting to the rods and the weapons and the quarrels and brawls and disputes and recrimination, the malicious words and the false speech. Here, these evil unwholesome states will cease without remainder. They're showing you in one paragraph how to have peace. But it, it is, um, the problem is that he he talked about peace here and then he got up and he went to bed and then these monks had to come back and talk to Maha Kachana and persuade him um, to explain to them what this really actually meant. And when they start talking about it, he's ex he starts to explain to them that when you are, um, when you are constantly thinking about it and tearing it apart and, and explaining it and trying to dissect it, you're getting personally involved in it. I used to have this broken down into two paragraphs and I don't know why I can't find it for you. I changed books and my other book was all marked. Every once in a while, I put the book aside with all the markings on it and <laughs> then I take a clean book and then I start again and then I can't find where I marked things. It's getting confusing. But if you're getting all involved what I'm trying to show you is in this sutta, he doesn't say outright clinging. He says mental proliferation, which is the clinging. And so he's saying, if you um, take the perceptions and notions that are coming, these ideas and stories and manifestations, just everything out, out of your mind, 
mental proliferation and they beset a man. That was the other word. What does beset mean? It means disturbs you. It besets you. It makes you just stop in your tracks and say, I can't, what am I going to do to get through this? How am I going to solve this problem? You are beset with problems, beset with confusion, beset with doubt. This is what beset means. It's an old word. Mental proliferation besets the man. And then if he's, if he does delight in it, welcome it and hold on to it, then it becomes the underlying tendency for lust and the underlying tendency for aversion. And it creates more views in his mind. And the underlying tendency to doubt rises up and the underlying tendency to conceit with my idea is right, your idea is wrong. We have to do everything that way of the underlying tendency to desire for being of the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the, that becomes, that's the cause of all of, of having war. The cause of the whole entire thing is, um, is this getting involved with the craving and the clinging and letting go of it. But in order to let go of it, we have to see it. We have to see it and understand it. And we have to step back and see it in small ways before we can see it in the larger ways. Sometimes I think, you know, we don't listen to the news here. We are very smart household. <laughs> we just don't listen to the news and we're much happier. Um, but once in a while, I turn it on and I just see everybody beset with the same problem of being caught and uh, in this person's views and this person's views. And no one seems to be willing to come together to say, but we all have this earth and what we need and we can provide for everyone and we could support the whole system if we would simply cooperate. We need to ban the building of weapons, period. We need to close them down. They need to be totally, completely illegal in any way, shape, or form across the whole globe. And we need the little green men to come in their little flying saucers and land and jump out and take all the things we have away from us and try to figure out, you know, how can we share? Somehow, I think the people running the world missed kindergarten they missed the nursery school and kindergarten but in this section what we're really trying to do is have you look more closely at the craving then look at clinging and then look try to see specifically at the clinging and this is what I have my students here doing now they come home and they frustrate me sometimes because I'll come back here and they'll say, yeah, and I could see dependent origination. I could see it, but why am I not changing? Aha, mm, aha. Why am I not changing if I can see dependent origination so clearly and see each piece of it? Mm -hmm. So if we take this back to TWIM, and we take this back to the steps in your practice, your steps are basically to recognize the unwholesome mind state and then release the unwholesome mind state and relax and then bring up the wholesome mind state and then keep the wholesome mind state going and make more wholesome mind states in support of that. That's the four, four sections of this, one, two, three, four. So, we were in the car the other day and I just burst out and I said, you know, you're not changing either one of you because you're going one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And it's like, this is a, a piece of music that's supposed to be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And you're going one, two, one, two, one, two. And you don't understand why you can't hear the melody. You can't hear the melody and you can't get the results of this piece of music because you refuse to count the time in the music. 
and the music for peace and the solution for suffering was one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, you see? So one, two, one, two, or three, four, three, four, it doesn't cut it. It's never going to change. So when the person comes back again and again, the first couple of times they come back to you and they say, I can't stop this suffering problem I'm having. What are you doing? I can see it when it's arising. Yeah, I can feel it as it's coming up. I can feel it coming up. I notice how my mind feels as it starts to pull Pull, feels like a pulling sensation to pull me down and slow me down. But I can see it. <laughs> there was so, but you're not going to change. So the steps were once you see it, then let it go. Relax, smile, come back and start laughing at yourself for forgetting to let it go and relax and smile and come back. See? Relax, smile, come back. Well, is that relax and smile and come back? No, it's relax, smile, come back. <laughs> it's relax, smile, come back. Imagine the jitterbug, you know, after World War II, everybody was dancing really fast and, you know, this choo, 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 you know, jitterbug thing. Imagine if they said the jitterbug and they did have steps for the jitterbug wasn't just a bunch of people jumping around. They had a plan and they had a floor plan for it. And you could learn all these different combinations to do in the jitterbug. I was amazed somebody showed that to me once. Yeah, but what would it be like? You just get exhausted if you just went out there and just shaking around and not doing anything productive, you never could do the jitterbug. And you'd get wiped out because you weren't paying attention to the way it was supposed to be working. This is true with anything. This is not, this is not uh, space math here. So if you're craving, you know, then it falls into clinging if you don't catch the feeling of tightness and let go. The clinging is the next lesson that's all the stories and everything. And you can feel that. You can, you can stop at the coffee shop and write down the story that was running through your mind while you were walking down the street. And then what's the habitual tendency, whatever it was that you got in your mind that you're going to do next, that's your habitual tendency. And what is the birth of this action, the birth of this habitual tendency or this habitual reaction? What is that? It's when you burst forth and you do it really fast. When you burst forth and you do it really fast, it's overtaking you. And you're not taking personal power with this at all. You are not in personal power. And so that's what's happening. And when you're doing this, you have to be very careful that you understand all of the parts all of the pieces this class will be over in about 30 minutes somebody just called on the phone so what is the the birth the moment that bursts forth that action bursts forth and then what exactly is the action that bursts forth this is where karma comes in karma sitting right there that is the action, actually each one of these links, the craving, the clinging, habitual tendency and birth of the action is feeding into the production of comma. And comma is the action. Those are the components of it. You see something. You see color and form. The eye, the color and form, the eye consciousness comes together and makes contact. We contact as condition, feeling arises. And with feeling as condition, craving arises. And tell me if I didn't notice something here. 
think we we did the lesson on feeling. We had contact up there and then we had three kinds of feeling as part of the being, but I think we should probably put feeling in to where the problem is again, so that you understand that the feeling is the basis for the craving. But you can't cancel out feeling, can you? You can't just come and say, well, I'm not going to suffer anymore because I'm not going to feel anymore. It doesn't work. Why? Because feeling is a natural thing which occurs within the human body and is a human part of the an human anatomy and functioning of the human being. It's not something we just decide to turn on or off. So when we go down here, the next one we see, we have the comma happen and then this number, uh, the next one is what is the aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair? And to do that, you simply go into 140, or 141, I think it's 141. You go to 141, and that's the one which is the exposition on the truth. And when you go through 141, that's where you see the pieces of everything. And in the front part of that sutta, he doesn't leave anything unexplained. He tells you what is the aging and the death, what is the sorrow, what is the lamentation, what is the pain, what is the grief, what is the despair? What we're learning to do is see the marana step by step and understand the consequences of it in relationship to individual phenomena and then build on that to larger and larger composites you see as you as you go along on this okay so part two of this project and this is something we didn't get to before and we should look at i should look at building this now we never got this far before. And this was originally designed to say, well, what is the solution to this whole thing, to this whole situation? We have to back up and say, can you detect the suffering? Yes, we can. And fine tuning our practice in many ways and doing exercises and practicing ourselves individually of how we learn how to detect arising suffering. That means detecting grief as it's coming up. That means detecting uh, physical pain in the body. Any type of, you know, that any way that you wanna write about this, it would be, you know, good for you to contribute to this by writing, um, something that contributes to the suffering in a way that you see it, then as you're practicing TWIM, you realize you have to purify the mind. And then you have to retrain the mind. So in this section, it should be talking about how do we detect the suffering, whether it is physical or whether it is mental. The next one should be purification of the mind. How do we purify the mind? And that's through this step about using right effort and that turns into right striving. And then what happens is we say, what kind of meditation is very effective in order to do this? And of course, we're a little prejudiced about that, I guess. <laughs> You know, but we really want to twim. We want to learn to twim because it, it takes us to the most important part of this. What kind of meditation should be done in order to let this go? And then what kind of supports we have? This might not, what is forgiveness meditation might not be placed there. It could be placed in another situation. Now what we're talking about here is we're talking about building the rest of the project the way it was originally um, built. This was originally conceived with one lesson per week for 52 weeks in a year. 
that's what it was actually perceived to be. And we got as far as I think 20 at one point, And then I think we moved it back to 17 of them and put it into 17. So this is where in the beginning of building this whole thing, we asked the people who were attending the Yahoo group, the original Yahoo group way back before the IO group existed, we had a, a Yahoo group that was built by me in 2003. And that Yahoo group was challenged to put together the pieces for the project and to wiggle them around until we got them in a particular order. And then I started writing them and they were sending things in and contributing ideas to how the order of it should be for them to learn it. Forgiveness is a support structure and there should be a way of having a section in here, again, in, 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 in my opinion, where um, you should be able to show the support pieces that help you to be able to practice the most. Then we had a section on and we this whole thing could be put way back in the beginning if we wanted to turn it into a book. This was something we looked at before. Um, should we take you back to how should I prepare for a meditation practice? If I'm going to build a meditation practice. What do you tell somebody? Good, do it. <laughs> no, it's a little bit more involved. But so what should I wear to meditate? And where should I meditate? And how should I sit? And for how long should I sit? And there's all kinds of little things we've told you over the years about this. And what if pain comes up? And how should I walk? And for how long? So we have this little piece in here about the hindrances and what you should do if pain comes up and how you should uh, uh, use meditation to help you if you have an injury too. I'm not sure if that's in here then how should I walk? And if I do walk, for how long should I walk? And these are all things that if you're in a retreat, yeah, all of these things uh, should be put into um, a little, into a section. Then what kind of things can block the progress? And this is where we get into the hindrances in the text. What does the text tell us about this? Going into a section on the hindrances specifically uh, pointing to these different ones. And this is an old list, the newer list you have in your, um, you have been given probably in the last couple of years is more detailed than this one is, but it's giving you the key points of what you would find in the different suttas that uh, explain to you, what about the hindrances? What am I supposed to do? And then, getting looking more closely at situations of reviewing lust and attachment and what is hatred and aversion and what is sleepy dull mind and what is restlessness guilt and remorse why why does it happen or how does it we know how it happens but why does it happen in what situations does this come up in my life or doubt then um the next one is how can we give the most effective five point report to help a guiding teacher to help us the best they can. And that's something that we stick with using the five point reports that we use of how long was your longest sitting in a period of time and we, we keep track of you over the same period of time uh, for a period of time. In other words, if it's a week long, we, we want to know how long was the longest sitting in the last 24 hours. If we're coaching you in a coaching program, I, I ran some coaching programs once where every, I would check on you every three days. In the last three days, what was your longest sitting? We had a couple people, the way we do it here for a lot of clients is we will ask them, you know, once a week, what it, what is it that happened for the longest one this past week and what was the most remarkable thing that happened that you want to talk about how can we give the most effective five point report is an, an, an important thing because if we're all the teachers are using the same kind of report information 
we can talk to each other and help each other's um, each other's students easily. Q and A addressing any other problems or solutions is um, these are just Q and A items that came up in the past. But what is the job of the teacher or the guide, and what is the job of the student? And that would be referring you to ninety five and saying, go to suit number 95. It very effectively explains to you what exactly is the job for the student and what, what is the responsibility for the teacher. And then in part three, requisites for awakening. This is where we, the idea of this whole section of this, had we continued to do it, was to go into what the, what's the difference, what is enlightenment versus awakening and talking to you a little bit about that and how the term has been moved around across the centuries. And, you know, then what are the 37 requisites of awakening and breaking, then breaking them down for you to, you all know what they basically are, four foundations of mindfulness, four bases of spiritual power, four faculties. And, the, and you don't want to have to know about these before you start training, but as you're training, you want to know more about what they really are individually and why they're important. You will find out for yourself as you're practicing. So it isn't like teaching you the parts of using the bicycle before I'm going to let you get on the bicycle and ride. It's more like I want to put you on the bike and push you and cross my fingers. <laughs> that you don't fall off and, 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 you know, have you start steering the bike right away. But then I'm still going to explain to you about the parts of the bike in case anything happens so that you know what to do with everything. And part four was going deeper into the challenge of human cognition. And there's, uh, you know, been quite a bit of writing about this since, uh, I started writing this back in 2010. Um, Nanyananda put together his uh, books on dependent origination. And then uh, recently, um, based, I believe what uh, Delson is doing is taking apart each individual piece of the uh, dependent origination and talking about it that way. But my way of going over this is, you know, having you. Um, take a closer look at how the Buddha figured this out and how can we watch it personally ourselves and listening to people give accounts of exercises they've done that have helped them the most to understand how knowledge of this completely changes your life. It just completely unchanges your life when you get to the core of what human beings are really all about and how we are operating. And this is truly um, really fun to do this. What's the most direct way to deeply see the three characteristics of existence is fun. Just in doing that, I have a thing where I take you for a walk in the forest to understand the, um, the three characteristics of existence really, really, clearly. And um, did the, did Buddha Gautama leave us the development chart for us? And you, you know this because I've taught you over the years, there is a development chart in the Upanisa Sutta. And the, uh, the Buddha left us a progress chart. And his progress chart is, um, is very good too, in the form of the, um, what his statements were concerning his own monks, okay? The four different levels of progress on a progress chart. And this is just for you to have in your mind and to help anyone else who's practicing. Can I actually check up for myself? How am I doing? And it's good to know how you're doing. And the monks wanted to know how they were doing. And then did the Buddha leave us this progress chart for us to use? He did. And then the very last part of this at the bottom was to opening up the doorway to peace was 
the idea was to listen to the students write to me in reference, and we never got this far, in reference to how they see that you using meditation in the world moves towards peace. And second one is what's the best way to share what we are learning? Is it to um, sit down and put the person in front of you inside a meta bubble and lock the door and try to <laughs> explain all this to them? Or is, it, is there a fun way that you can actually teach this to anybody? And I'm good at finding fun ways of teaching taxi drivers and, you know, farmers and truck drivers and just the average person, uh, how neat this stuff really is and how it, it applies to absolutely everybody and every job opportunity in the world. And then we had open topics, three spaces for open topics. And then we looked at the closing of this. And then at the end of this in section six, were um, these were training notes that a training note is when people write in uh, something, uh, send us something, um, and then we turn it into part of this. And we explain the, the, uh, the notes at the end. And that was about the, the end of it. So this is what all we're going into. And then we tried to, at the very end of this project, the idea was, in the end, can we recap the contents of the training? And this is what we came up with. The foundation training is meant to bring out the full picture of what most venerable Bhante Bimala Ramsey Mahatera discovered when he reclaimed the tranquil wisdom insight meditation. The Buddhist training was and still can be a fully encompassing meditation practice incorporating generosity, the dana, the morality, and the mental development in one solution for a troubled world. The meditation instructions are given in, in the beginning so that you can actively practice while you are training. You will gain lots of insights with full understanding if you keep the entire set of information and you use this again and again and again. And this has been proven with this program because it's been brought up, uh, requested that it be taught. I think this is maybe the fifth time now that we should do it again. The meditation um, instructions, um, the training starts at the beginning with five aggregates and six sense doors, which each of us is made up of, are the first thing that we learn about. And each person experiences their existence in this life through feeling and human cognition is next. And the differentiation between how feeling arises and why feeling is not emotion is important to understand, which is great news leading to the clear hope of getting a handle on life instead of being beaten up by it all the time. The training gives you a clear and simple terminology for good communication with teachers. This was an objective now. And short definitions that define craving and clinging, their similarities and differences, Meditation and mindfulness define how they work together and proper investigation is demonstrated directly from the Buddhist texts. Because things are not so clear, most students begin to fully experience and understand how the actual purification of mind happens through this meditation. They, you will know by seeing what the Four Noble Truths are for and eventually how they exist within each of the links of the impersonal process of dependent origination. So in short, what you're going to learn is how to practice the same experiment the Buddha did himself. The training is interspersed with exercises that monks did in the beginning of all of this. Referrals are given to supporting Dhamma Talks videos and other references found on the website at Dhamma Sukha. And if you guys want to go in there and find the ones that you think are the most helpful, you should do that. 
and let us know what you think are the most helpful ones uh, for different parts of this. And all of the referrals are aligned with the same teaching approach. There are examples of interactions between people in daily life that show how clear understanding can change the outcomes of those same situations in life and but reduce the suffering. So that this is a game, the end part, I don't, oh, I'm almost, I can probably get to the end, okay. What happens after this information is given? This is Q jumping in now. You'll be instructed how to give a four point or five point uh, report about your meditation experience to a teacher. And this is so you can get advice on the next steps that you take. And you will meet the Dhamma in a new way with the Buddha as the premier meditation teacher who spent 45 years refining this teaching. And what is our responsibility for the course if we take the course? Well, how much you get involved is totally up to you because if you are participating, your responsibility is to contribute questions, discuss them with us, dig deeper and then, than you have before. And when you write to us, stay on the topic. Don't go far afield. Always let us know that uh, what you want to better understand in these lessons and keep asking questions because this is how we learn more. And it's how we learn to be better teachers. And when this was first being designed, um, I had only been teaching in, you know, privately teaching for a couple of years and wanted something um, that would immediately, you know, improve what I was doing as a teacher. Don't be shy, write to us and tell us if a topic needs to be more clearly written about. We wanna know if you want it to be shortened or smaller words being used. Do you need better examples or want more poly words? Tell us what you need. What other things about Buddhism do you wanna know about? All information is considered and is, if not used immediately, will be discussed in the future. You see, as I said, this is an outline for a book that was never printed and it's still functionally flexible. I mean, it's, it's I think we hung it up on the Damasuka website, one version of it's hanging up there, but it never was compressed into a book. And I'm sure it's been used a number of times as a source for what's been, been uh, printed. I'm sure of that too. But what other things about Buddhism do you want to know about? All the information will be considered. And if it's not used immediately, it can be discussed in the future. Most important thing we need to know is that if you're understanding the Dhamma and beginning to use it in life, because if this Dhamma does not lighten your life and bring you more contentment and balance, then what good is this practice? It's like, why bother? Why spend the time doing it? But all of the installments are edited um, by, it was by Bonte Vimal Ramsey. They were edited originally with me um, before posting and um, they will be posted on the website. We probably should say at Damasuka, um, Damasuka IN on this, Bonte, you know? Yes. Isn't Damasuka, that right? In, yes. We will uh, post them later. Uh, yeah. Currently, I think we don't have any uh, dedicated person. We'll kind of have, have a dedicated person later. Mm -hmm. Okay, wait a minute. I don't know how we do that. How do you say damasuka.in? Well, we can just take this out there. We can probably just take this out of here. We no, just what take you this done out. Is correct, huh? What you have done is correct, I think so. Yeah, well, it's. I'm talking about the Yahoo group. Of, it's really an IO group list now this is not applicable this paragraph is kind of can be taken out really okay i think just like that okay does this mean that we get to contribute to the writing of this new workbook yeah actually i was ignorant of printing back then and publishing <laughs> i didn't know any better i thought it would be fine to do it this way some people got very upset about it and i'm there no i would prefer to create a book this is a different approach to building a book. It means we acknowledge that this group of, there were over 550 people in the Yahoo group at that time. 
Um, that's the best measure we can have of how we're doing when we teach the Dhamma in today's world. That's key. Can you learn this and keep it going? Us asking you. So in the next few days, um, you know, I started posting stuff. This is how we did it. I started posting one, one of these, uh, uh, the first one, okay, was posted and like, like this, right? There. And you're reading that one. And then did you alone decide to build this project? People were asking questions about this. All this stuff doesn't really matter anymore, Bonte, <laughs> you know. Um, but um, I actually didn't. There were We had a vote on what we were going to do is how this book got started. There were over 75 people that answered a poll to request this training in the beginning. And so when you contribute questions to us, if you set up your subject line in the email um, to us very carefully, then I can pick it up really fast. I'm really good at losing things in the email. So you need to do it the proper way. Uh, this helps me to, to easily identify uh, which installment you're asking a question about. So if you were to if I start posting these again, the way I did before, um, I would post it and you would put um, FSO1, what is Donna? They put that in, call the subject line. So this is just about the, about how this, I thought that page nine was the end of this. Sure, hope so. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. I look, so you, you give a little title for each one of the installments and I issue it out to you. And these installments originally were translated into Spanish uh, when we first began, because in Chile, one of our students was building a Spanish site that really, if I had gone to South America at that time, I probably could have stayed there because I had a, a, over a hundred people or more that were ready to jump into this, but I didn't, I ended up, everything happened differently. Um, and we have a glossary. If you want a glossary, we can keep building a glossary as we go along, but we have a beginning of a glossary already that we use. And um, what we decided this, when I say we, I mean, Bonte and me decided that the best way to deal with building a glossary for training people with TWIM is to make sure that you have the poly words that you're going to run into no matter what temple you run into you're going to find these these uh, topics and these particular things so it isn't so much giving you a great big glossary of poly that's important as it is to make you feel comfortable if you go to any Buddhist function and they're they're talking about like Paticca Samapada or they're talking about a lesson on clinging the Upadana or or craving and they're talking about what is tanha, what is craving, what is tanha. And you're going to see a lot of that. And so that's what we we decided to try to do. And um I don't think it would be involved so much with us doing it this time. But you should send me a note and let me know what you're most interested in um, as far as this goes, that you want you want to do it and we can reach out to other people. And I'm going to do this probably again on Wednesday, I think, Bonte, and we should put some effort into working on this one, you know, subject matter to try to get it to as many people as possible to reach out and try to um, get as many people involved in it as possible. So I need to know if you have any questions um, coming back on this. Um, let me see if I can, I don't know how to go back on this. How do I go back this? Stop the share, let's see, stop the share. Okay, and come back out here to the share screen again. This is all this one is this other document that I sent you. 
was this is how far, and I'm not going to do a lot on this. I'm just going to zip through it real quick. This is just showing you how far it went last time we did it. That's as far as we got was up to um, that, that, but I would rather use the old framework and keep the building, not fool around with the, with the new framework. And we're just, I would check these installments and they'll be given to you in advance because this way you're going to get them more in advance than you would normally with me because I'm late usually telling you what I'm going to do. Okay. <laughs> so anybody have anything they want to ask about this at this time? Hi Hello. guys. Thanks, sister. I'm really sorry we, we turned up a little bit um, late for today. So I I just wanted to, to clarify with you about what your direction is for, for all the work. I really, really like um, how all of this hangs together. Um, are, are you saying you want to go through each stepping stone again and, and to to no, what, what, when we, when we do this? No, when we do this, we're going to run the program. So that means like for the next, uh, basically, I'll be doing it also probably be doing it like on um, if I can get the interest in the other group as well, be running it on Sunday and running it on Wednesday and and just keep going through. I have to rewrite them as I go. So I, I just it makes me forces me to pull them up and review them and see where they're at. And these are not don't bother going to the website like Damasuka and finding this and pulling that up because theirs are not the most recent ones. So don't uh, don't bother going over there to find those at this time. I think if these turn out reasonably well, we could ask him to post. Um, we could ask him to post the new version as we do it this time. If we could do that, Bonte. Damagavesi. Okay. Uh, uh, do you want uh, this to be updated on the Dhammasuka? Because I have sent you a link uh, that uh, is uh, library.dhammasuka.org foundation. That is where uh, they have kept uh, the foundation, uh, this thing. The link uh, is not working as such. I, I'm sure it's not. Most of the stuff that I put up there isn't working. So <laughs> I don't know. So anyway, that's all right. Um, I don't know how that works out, but anyway. Um, so we I, we can just do it on Damasuka India. That's all we can we can do, I guess. Just put it up at Damasuka India, and we can let him know at the end if we want to shift it and put put repost it with the new ones. That's all. Yeah. Don't you think so? I think that would be the answer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this gives you quite uh, a lot of um, information that we went over in, in the bottom part of that. You didn't need to, I didn't need to go any further than I think page seven when I went down through that. So what's been uh, written before went up through 17 and originally the project was like um, one, one uh, it was supposedly supposed to be 52 of them for 52 weeks of the year. We were so ambitious. It was really, <laughs> really something looking back on it. You know, we were very ambitious about it because nothing had been written at that time. Yeah. And so, um, and this was sort of like a, a final exam for me in a way. This was what Bonke was pushing me through the topics. Uh, you have to do it this way and everything to find out what I, what I had and what I didn't have and that sort of stuff. So as a teacher training, I was always forever in teacher training, seems like, you know, because that's just the way it is, you know. Uh, how, what are you supposed to do when you have a master teacher sitting next to you and you can ask him anything you want anytime? <laughs> and the scary part was I really did. <laughs> and his, his, the story goes, it's a true story that he, meaning Bhante Bimala Ramsey would ask Usulananda questions, so many questions. He would just never stop asking questions. And one day, 
Uslananda turned to him and said, you know, you are going to be the smartest, wisest man in the universe. Um, you know, by the time, uh, you, if you have to come around again. And uh, he said, what do you mean? He says, because the, first of all, the one thing that's going to happen to you is there's going to be somebody who shows up who asks you what as many questions as you're asking me. And then by the time you leave this realm, you're going to go into another realm like the wisest man <laughs> in existence. So this was like a standing uh, joke that was going on here. I was driving this car thousands of miles, you know, across the United States and everything, visiting all these temples and, you know, working as an attendant with him over those years and um, constantly asking him questions. And it was like, ask me some more, ask me some more, ask me some more. So that's what, what I did. And that was the way we did that. So anybody have any questions about anything? And you can remember, yeah, May. Uh, Sister Gemma, can I just clarify? So um, for each lesson, as we progress through this foundation series, how mm -hmm. can we best contribute um, to this project as well, students? When when I, you know, I would go over one and review it, and then I would issue it out to you guys, send it through to you guys. And then we would do it in class, we would go through it in class, and anybody has any questions on it, or wants to contribute more, they want more information on that subject. That's what we want to know about. We want to know if we are using short enough words, if we are clear enough on a topic, if we're writing too much on a topic and it needs to be much shorter. And a few of them need that, you know, there was a few in there that got pretty long. The um, initial, uh, initially we tried to, um, initially the attempt was to never have one that was more than 2000 words, that that was, that was the, the top number. But I, they should really, in my opinion, they should go down less than that. It should be less than um, it should be less than two thousand. Um, and I have this. Um, I don't know if any of you got it, but Karuna Das's book is this book that I just I worship the way he set up. And I don't think it was him. I think it was the person that did the layout for his printing for his PhD thesis. But Professor Karuna Dasa from the Hong Kong University wrote a book called Foundations of Buddhism, I think. It was Foundation or Fundamentals or something. And he had 10 chapters and each one was 10 pages long. And I thought this is the most amazing organization I had ever seen uh, anybody do because what happens with these PhD theses is a lot of times is they, they run away with you. You have, you have short chapters and short and short, and then you get to the, your favorite part of it and it goes like that, you know, it gets really big and you feel lost. And to see somebody uh, arrange this the way he did was uh, quite unique. So this is the place where um, we, I wanted to know, you know, are people, we want you to have the information, but the simplest way possible. Is there a simpler way we can do this? Don't be shy about this. We really want to know what people think about it. You know, is it too long? Is it too short? Is it too difficult? The words you're using, is it too repetitive? You know, too too repetitive or what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, th this is this is a very impressive project. Um, the thing that comes across, um, I've got a couple of notes here to, to cover, but first of all, um, I think you're right about the 2000 words, it's, it's too much, but only as a first pass. I think, you know, the way it's presented, there can be click for more, as it were, if someone wants a further explanation around that. And the other thing around this also is uh, uh, the, for many people, uh, a short video clip 
uh, describing something in more detail is also very, very powerful. And I'm talking three minutes, two minutes, five minutes, it, you know. Um, so that, and one of the things that you're very good at is um, filling, in the, filling in the wider picture and that sort of thing, which is actually quite difficult to write about, but actually comes across very well with the, with the short mm -hmm. video. It's always been it's always been a mystery, like what to do with this thing, you know, because at, in the beginning, it was um, an early effort to do something online like this. Um, and then and then we thought um, we, we were doing it as an article each every couple of weeks, there was an article and, and we were doing it that way. And yeah. um, and then those days we didn't have a. Uh, well, we had PowerPoint, but we weren't using it very much. But doing PowerPoints is one way of, of doing this. And I agree with you. There were two things that I think that were left out of the of planning, the idea for this thing. We just weren't there yet in, at that time in 2010, you know? But now when you look at it, the thing I think of is first of all, um, very short uh, PowerPoint, pieces that you could do uh, on, a, on a topic. Like for instance, the Donna C. Lubavina could be done that way, you know, pretty easily. And there's uh, other parts too, but um, what was I gonna say? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not even, I'm not even sure whether PowerPoint is the, is the right thing because it's another, it's another um, uh, text-based text -based, uh, thing. Um, I think, you know, video, if we think that some people like to watch something, some people like to read it, some um, some people like to listen, you know. Um, well, when you the, say when you say video, what do you mean? Well, just you you right now in, in front of the camera uh, and just giving a, an additional um, explanation around Dharma Sila Um it, It's just a you know it, it's it's I think it's more engaging than the PowerPoint. Uh, I, but other people may have different, different views, and that's very welcome. Um, but it's it's those it's those short filling in bits, um, which uh, these days seem to make learning more more and more accessible. Um, I don't know what other people's views are, and really, I'd welcome. Yeah, you. yeah, I I think this is a good point. This is a very good point. Um, so and, and, and it gives them the opportunity to connect to you. And, Can and we, the crazy and, and the rest of it uh, as a as an individual um, as well. Uh huh. So are we are we on screen while we're doing this, or what are we, what are we looking at? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so it, it might be just you, just having just just clarifying a point, um, uh, as you do in in many of our in, in many of our talks that we listen to and the rest of it. But it would be short. It would be you know it would be a three minute, five minute. That's most sort of eight minute clip, um, uh, you know, which is an exploration. I had, a, I had a, I had a terrible dream. I have to tell you about this dream, just a terrible dream where I was, um, I woke up and, and the order was um, short, short, short. And I was screaming, it can't be done. It can't be done. It can't be done. And then I, I felt, I lay down again. And then I woke up a few minutes later and it was saying longer, longer, longer. And I was saying, where am I? Where am I? Where am I? <laughs> and I was just, oh my goodness. <laughs> You know, because in this life, I've been, I've been, uh, this guy, I was very short, it's very interesting, very short in my entertainment years of very short of dealing with an audience and then doing uh, music and then very short and very concise, but not off, off stage. Off stage was a very difficult thing for me. Mm. Yeah. And, and uh, I don't know. Just to pick up a, another point. Um, we, we were talking uh, when we were together in Poland about um, how you how you uh, showed that to uh, certain church members or, or people who were suspicious of this being Buddhism, how it absolutely you know fitted in with uh, in that 
instance, um, what the what the Christian perspective was about round responsibility and and take you know and this that and the other. And I think that that little bit that you described to me, and I wish I'd actually uh, uh, taken notes on it, um, would be very useful right at the start to universal. You can, oh, okay, like. Um... It's a it's a perspective for all people. It's a it's a um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an you, all people perspective. Yeah. But you, yeah. you particularly mentioned something in the in the in the Christian structure because you know they, there would be suspicion and and uh, and possibly uh, you know. Um, well, basically, I, what I did was I basically talked about. Um, uh, when I went to do this initially, this is probably what I told you. When I went there that night, I had planned to do a um, guided a guided sitting at the beginning of this uh, that's called Christian Centering Prayer. Okay, and um, the 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 priest, the Catholic priest who designed this uh, Christian Centering Prayer, he he picked it up uh, from some ancient texts. Uh, this is what the early Christians had done this sort of prayer and I was all ready to do that and then I thought why am I doing that when I walked in the room and I saw the the vibration was basically what what have we here you know this is a, something we've never seen before this uh, you know Buddhist nun uh, is going to, to do and there was actually fear in their eyes of, of some of them. And one of them was very adamant with me during the retreat. We thought she'd never come around. And in the end, she wanted to take it home to her state and immediately translate it and start teaching it. That's how <laughs> that ended up. You know, she was so excited with what it was. But then I saw the immediate message to me was there has to be a simpatico here that is set up immediately between you and, and, um, and the Christian who is uh, listening to this, and in this just isn't Christian, this is Christian, Hindu, Islamic, uh, you know, Muslim, whatever. Um, okay, and um, it doesn't matter who the person is. It's a universal thing for humanity. So the universal thing has to come out, and in their case, it has to do with the morality. The morality became the binding issue the morality uh, of, of laying out a quick map of the Ten Commandments and the five precepts in full. And when you break down the five precepts in full, you know, you have to go to the sutta where it breaks it down. You know, like you have one that says, don't tell lies, but that's actually, let's see, it's lies and then it's gossip and then it's slander, right? and then it's a harsh language. So you have four commandments there, you see. And once they began to understand uh, the, the uh, simpatico, the, the way there was a, a balance between what we were doing, the only thing that was missing was uh, God wasn't there uh, to, to oversee everything and say, and, and this, is, this is the deal, okay? Um, it was up to us to personally investigate ourselves. And the other part of it was taking the person to the scientific side of this, because the scientific side of this whole thing is that, you know, Siddhartha Gautama is the father of neurocognitive science. And I, I've done that, that um, argued that in, in a presentation in a 30 minute presentation once where people actually remembered that I did it. <laughs> you know, it was very funny. I thought no one's ever gonna remember this. And they showed up a, a, a year or two later running into me in Malaysia and said, aren't you the one that did this? And I said, oh yeah, um, but it was over in Sri Lanka. And he said, well, these monks are from Sri Lanka. We heard you do that. These nine monks were sitting to the right. There were about 40 monks. That was why I wanted to do it, that uh, presentation. And so it's, it's getting the person into seeing the universality of 
what it is that we're teaching has nothing to do with an individual person. It has to do with the human race. It's this, it's this, this part of it. So like you're saying, you should do this in the beginning of this whole thing. And I think you're absolutely right. It should be done in the beginning of it. That, that's what you think, right? Yes, because, um, and also one of the things that you took, uh, took me through when we were talking about that, was how you reframed the, the, the training in, in terms of um, you know, what, in, in this particular instance, a Christian context, um, you would be expected to, to try to develop. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, because the question, the, the issue of giving people a 10-day retreat and giving it to them uh, in, in a platform where you're teaching um, different groups of religions. This isn't an individual, it's non-religious. This is a non-religious issue. And from what are they trying to get out of it? They're, the things they're, that you're taking them out of it is a change in personality. And you're talking peace versus war. And you're talking not just uh, you know suffering and uh, not you know cessation of suffering but you're you're extending that from suffering and cessation of suffering to war and peace and to the community and to the individuals and take that's where you bring in uh you know um bring in uh the honey ball sutta majima nikaya number 18 and you bring in um also bring in the uh, the practice the, what you're going to use is an exercise in 148 and I think it's um, 148 and 137 or something like that and you're and you're taking you're, you're showing the person this is something for us to discover as human beings I mean I still don't have the answer I don't think anybody has the answer Jeremy whatever his name is he doesn't have the answer I tried to listen to all of that. <laughs> And he has the idea and, and the shift the paradigm and how to get the human beings to all be at peace and everything, but he still doesn't have the delivery system. The delivery system is the, is the most complex thing. And I think what we have is this really fun way of delivering this. If, if you can, if you take, get it delivered to, to young people and you're, you're looking at, you can't look at it this way. You cannot look at the issue of suffering and, um, and cessation of suffering in terms of this is the problem, folks, and we have the weekend and we have to come up with the answer. Uh-uh, that's not it. Now, the Russians and the Chinese, they've got, the Chinese are really good at this. We've been around 8,000 years and we can wait. <laughs> so anything that they want to have happen in the entire world, okay, however they want the world to be, they're happy because the patience is built into them. I don't quite understand it, but they can wait, you see. And so this is what we need to understand, that we should be going into kindergarten, not even high school. We should struggle to get it into kindergarten and into the grade school and the middle school and go from there because we need to look at what we're creating for our grandchildren and great grandchildren. We don't need to be, we can talk about what we're doing now, get excited about it for sure. Yeah, get excited about it, get dedicated to it but understand that it's not happening next week. This is the thing, you see? Look, if the, if, 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 I don't know if, if the Russians have sleepers in the United States, but I, you know, I certainly believe it's possible, but they, were, they created a system of, they're not interested in what they did in 1960 or in, in the late 50s after the Second World War if they did plan that program the way it's explained is going to come to fruition look at where we are it's 2022 by 2025 now these people that were come in the effects of it now this is nothing to do with politics what i'm talking about but the whole theory is there we get frustrated as people if we cannot have what we want when we want it 
don't we? That's our biggest problem. We want instant gratification. Well, the best thing I've seen so far for instant gratification is TWIM. Honestly, it is the best thing I have seen so far in 70 years, 73. <laughs> I just found out last week I was 73. I thought I was 72 the whole time I've been here. <laughs> it was so funny. Go ahead. One of the things about the instant gratification is that also uh, that it's also an instant way of removing instant gratification. I didn't get it. Or the desire for that. Um, oh, uh, you mean with twim? It's it's, it's a twim. way of instant removing. Yeah, I I don't know if you were here earlier, but I think before I started this, I was talking a little bit about something and saying my students here come in after spending a day, uh, a couple days somewhere else and they come trotting in they're all excited because they can see dependent origination. And I'm, you know, like, okay. But the thing is they're all excited because they can see dependent origination, but I'm not changing. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So can you tell me what's wrong here? And what's wrong is you're trying to do a dance in four, four time with one, two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? This is a piece of music, all right? And it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It isn't one, two, one, two, one, two. And if you have a student that insists upon letting go, coming back, letting go, coming back, letting go, coming back, they're doing one, two, one, two, one, two. They're never going to change. So they may as well just resign themselves. They're never going to change and go have some ice cream. <laughs> You know, because they're not going to change. Okay, they have to be doing the whole recipe. You see, you have to do that. And so um, he finally got oh. it, but I had, to, I had to stand here and make him say, so what's wrong? So what's wrong is you're not dancing. You're just, you're just plodding one, two, one, two, and you're not going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You have to dance the dance in order to understand it and have the changes happen. Yeah. And they happen fast too. And, and, and one of the ways that you, uh, uh, again, just going back to what we discussed, one of the ways that you, you described it um, was very succinctly about how all of those steps, one, two, three, and four, fitted in with the um, uh, expectations, desires, and um, uh, um, training, if you like, in, for instance, the, the case that we did was that, that Christian environment. So then there was a real acceptance around what the practice was trying to do and, and how yeah, it would fit That's in. right. Yep. So I think that's, that's that, that. And then it, and then it kind of takes the whole issue about this being something alien out because there's, a, there's an identity to it. And, and I think your half hour lecture on uh, harder with neurocognitive science, um, you know, that would be also a very, very useful thing to have. Um, I'm sorry, on what, what part was it? But you said your, your lecture on um, Siddhartha Gautama being the father of neurocognitive science. Oh, yeah, that, that is, that 29 also, minutes. That, that is also 29. that would be enormously yeah. helpful. Because yeah, I I found that I found that the other day. I didn't even know I still had it. It's a PowerPoint, and I found it, and um, I didn't even I didn't even know it was still there. And um, yeah, because it was twenty. It's twenty nine minutes. <laughs> the the threat The threat was you can only do it if it's thirty minutes long. I'll pull you off the stage if it's over thirty minutes. And I walked off the stage and I said, "Look at the clock. It's twenty nine point twenty nine minutes." <laughs> <laughs> and I say, you know, it's like <laughs> the really important thing here is you see so many words around cognitive science now are, are entering common usage. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, 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 and unless it's framed in the right way, it's a bit like the word mindfulness now. It, it will then lose its, 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 uh, its meaning. Um, and so if, you, if, if that was available, framing this work around that, um, uh, I think it's, it, that would be another very, very helpful uh, introduction. So that's a good idea, trying to figure out a title for it in, in relationship directly to the neurocognitive. Um, well, I think you've already to, got a title. The father of the yeah. science. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, he, it's like, there is a man, I looked it up. I, I did look it up. I can't, I can't remember his name, but I looked it up to see, is there a father of neurocognitive science? Yeah, and there's somebody who takes the claims that, you know. So the next step would be to see if he'd been exposed to Buddhism, you know. That would be the next step to this guy. Was he exposed to Buddhism? But I can't, it tells you what it, let me see if I can find it real quick. But it tells you, um, it does, um, let me see. Um, here, okay, I, I did it, I just did it. Father of, oops, of, um, neurocognitive science. Yeah, I, I went and I found it. Well, it didn't work. Came out frontiers of neurocognitive science. But the father of neurocognitive science, um, we met. Uh, here it is, here it is. Here you go. Michael Gazaniga. Dr. Michael Gazaniga about his new autobiography. Tales from both sides. I don't know. Remembering the father of cognitive psychology. And that one is Dick Neisler. Dick Neisler. He was the father of cognitive psychology. And I think that's uh, if they're putting it, I don't know what dates they're putting it, but you know, um, Dr. Harvey back in 1940 was actually. The father, I guess you could say he was an early father of um, behavioral modification therapy. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. And, and he was, yeah, 1940, I think his name was Harvey. Yeah. And what happened was he, he discovered uh, accidentally <laughs> to bring a, um, to bring a uh, client in and, uh, instead of going back and saying, and what happened before that and before that with Freud's way of going backwards, he took one incident of anger and um, worked, got the person to work through that, telling him, talking to him through of what happened in one particular incident of anger. Yeah. And yeah. the problem for, uh, Dr. Harvey was Pearl Harbor, because when Pearl Harbor happened in 1941 in December, his stuff got put in a box and shoved on a shelf. And it was the same thing that happened to the Fisher carburetor. <laughs> the Fisher carburetor was a, a carburetor for a normal car that could give you 40 miles to a gallon of gas in 1940, but then when the war hit, um, it disappeared. And then when it came back on the scene, the moment it showed its face, uh, General Motors bought it and they shelved it. They wanted control over the gas and automobile industry somehow, and they shelved it and they would never release it to the public. So here you had all these years, but these people wanted to manage this thing. Same thing with what happened with Paul, uh, with this um, Dr. Harvey. And I stumbled on his name in my daughter's psychology book for her graduate work. It was sitting there. And he, when I read the paragraph about what he did, 
I just about started laughing, saying, well, that's what your mother does. That's what I do. <laughs> I teach people exactly how this is happening and how it's all working when you go through a tiny incident in your life, how everything is working perfectly. And um, once you see it, it, we have this unique thing that I keep going back to in 128, Majima Nikai number 128, and it's in the last paragraph. Um, and it's something that just sticks in your mind, or it just sticks in my mind like crazy. And it says, I understood that, now this is talking about 11 different hindrances. And he says, I understood that doubt is an imperfection of the mind and had abandoned doubt and imperfection of the mind. So what he's saying is the moment that he understands there, there's an imperfection, he abandons it. This is what it's, it's saying. The moment that he does that. Okay. And so in the case of Harvey, what he was trying to get the person to figure out with anger was the moment that you see the detect the uh, symptom, the moment you detect the tightening, the tension and tightening, that is where you you can uh, let go of the of the uh, the anger at that spot. And then eventually what we have in neurocogn in, in the uh, neural plasticity, what we find is that the brain is learning in a very simple way. Tap, 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 tap. And as long as you tap the same way. And so thus the, the students coming in this week and saying, we can't understand what's wrong. And you say, what do you mean what's wrong? Well, what's wrong is uh, I'm doing this, but I'm not changing. Well, what are you doing? Steps are four steps and you're doing two steps and you expect it to change. It's not gonna change. It's pretty simple. So we, you can take this whole thing and you just go backwards like this. And then where I took you with the, uh, with the, with the statement in reference to the, the Chinese, the greatest thing may in the world growing up was you have to be patient like the Chinese, because we were taught that when we were young, we have to be patient because they're so patient. They get the answer right every single time. <laughs> My grandmother was kicking, you know, you have to be more patient. Do it again until you see it. Do it again until you see it and memorize. And that's all we're asking you to do. But we've moved away in, in this day and time. We have moved away. Social psychologically moved away. That's what I want to say. The social psychology was a course they had to put me in it when I went back to college at one point because they didn't want to put me in a first year psychology course. They threw me in a social psychology uh, classroom. And there was a, another woman and I, we were both older women going back to school. And we had so much fun because these 18 year olds, they were just, uh, they didn't understand this textbook at all. And we were just laughing hysterically because we had each had three children <laughs> and we knew how everything worked and we were constantly laughing and they were struggling with understanding everything. But anyway, with this, what I'm basically talking to you about is it is the repetition and we are not in a, in a patient point in history. We have uh, produced, we could have a funny book, maybe we could write a funny book called The Children of the Mall Mind. And you would probably pick the book up just because you wanted to know what I was talking about, but the children who grew up in the land of the mall mind are the children who go to the mall to buy whatever they need, whatever they want. It can be food or shoes or a hammer or nails, just anything. 
They go to the mall because they only have to drive to the mall, park their car. And when they go in this big place, everything is in one place. But here in Asia, one street can be dedicated to the develop to somebody who makes hammers. I spent a day once walking down a street, at least an hour talking to these individual people in the stores in Sri Lanka, you know, because I all they made there were hammers. That was all. No screwdrivers, nothing, just hammers. This was the street of the hammers. And this old man was trying to explain over there is the street of the chairs. What do you mean? I said, well, on that side of the park is where they make the chairs and the other side of the park, all the shops, they upholster the chairs. So they had everything broken down the old way, you see. But we don't shop anymore. We don't shop. We just simply uh, just are in a rush. But these ideas, you should send me a note on these ideas for this, um, you know, that, that you were talking about. And we should probably, anybody else have any anything to throw into this? Anybody want to say anything else? Well, you certainly did make me feel better today. That's good. I had a rough night last night, but that just comes and goes. So, oh yeah, I should give you a little bitty report here, maybe before I stop, because I get, I get to start. I get to start radiation therapy, and so I get to start that this uh, coming week, and it, it'll run for two or three weeks. I had a lecture on how fragile I am. I love it when they do that. It makes me feel like a tiny person instead of a big person or something. I don't know. But when they tell me I'm fragile, I was always like the tough cookie and the, you know, the one that's going to be the first woman in the dojo to get her brown belt and <laughs> all this stuff, you know, and let's go skydiving and stuff like this and uh, hang gliding. And now they're telling me I'm fragile. So this is an interesting thing to experience. So I will let you go and I will, uh, we will start this next week. Okay. I will do the introduction for them on, on Wednesday. Um, we should just to see if we can get anybody else to come into it. Okay. We will keep this on uh, Sundays, no? This foundation. Are we just going to do it on Sundays? That uh, would be uh, better, no? Okay. Or, uh, do you want and I'm uh, Wednesday. We can do uh, uh, something else, or you want to do it? Uh, uh, no, that's okay. Yeah. What should we do on What should we do on Wednesdays? Because sometimes uh, uh, not all people who come on uh, Sundays are there available on Wednesday. So somebody may okay. get a kind of miss. Uh, Wednesdays okay. we can do suttas, and uh, on uh, Sundays we can do this foundation. Okay, sounds good. Okay. So I hope you had fun today. I hope it was interesting. Let's uh, say a prayer and we'll come back soon. Mm -hmm. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Bell. <laughs> okay. It's really trying to ring really hard. <laughs> we have all these little personalities. Okay. I will see you next week. Have a good week. Bye bye. 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 Thanks for coming. Everybody.